guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Welcome, everybody. Es ist mir eine besondere Freude, Ihnen den heutigen Vortragenden vorzustellen, anzukündigen. Ian Buruma, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to Munich. I know you speak German very well, but I'm switching to English because this is a bilingual conference, I insist. And we're happy and honored that you accepted our invitation and will speak about forgetting the lessons of war. As I said earlier today, the question of lessons learned is keeping us quite busy here at this center. And the question of memory, of what we remember, and what we tend to forget, some things we even better forget, some things not. History is a tricky business, for one, because it might not repeat itself, but it does seem to rhyme once in a while. And secondly, because we're ourselves stuck in history's midst. Then again, this is also good news because we do actively participate in its creation and its writing. Ian Baruma is somebody who knows how to do that extremely well. He tells the tales of history, personal and more general ones, and he does it as well and as successful as other people write great fiction, which, by the way, he also does, and equally wonderful. Among his many books is one which makes him the best and most excellent speaker for tonight's talk, The Year Zero, A History of 1945, a fascinating account that takes the reader from the Bavarian countryside to Tokyo from liberated concentration camp Bergen-Belsen in the British zone to France, to Palestine, to Ukraine, and other places. A global or almost global history of the year 1945, which draws our attention to the fact that this world war did not only affect the traditional West, but much further beyond, and not only the cities, but the various and remotest countrysides. Like in many of his other books, Buruma, in his Year Zero, introduces us to the ways of human nature, explores it gently and with sensitivity and elegance, displaying the post-war situation not as a conflict between two sides, but one of many fronts. Ian Buruma has held a professorship at Bard College and was editor of the New York Review of Books, and he is the author, as I mentioned, of a large oeuvre of novels, historical writing, and essays. Among his most recent ones are Their Promised Land, My Grandparents in Love and War, A Tokyo Romance, Theater of Cruelty, Art Film and the Shadows of War, and together with the year zero, this just covers the last six years, which is incredibly impressive. So the floor is yours. Very much looking forward to your talk. Erstens herzlichen Dank für Ihre Einladung. Es ist eine große Freude. Ähm, leider muss ich meinen Vortrag auf Englisch halten, weil mein Deutsch ist mich peinlich und für Sie noch peinlicher, denke ich. Aber Sie können Ihre Fragen auf Deutsch stellen, und, weil ich alles, fast alles verstehe. Und dann äh, werde ich auf Englisch antworten. Um, my book, of course, is about violence and so is this... Um, uh, conference, but I won't say that, that much about violence. Um, when I grew up in the shadow of World War II in the German occupation in the Netherlands, um, there was talk of violence in boys' stories and stories from people in, in general, but it was all about German violence, really, uh, German atrocities. They were the villains. Uh, and then um, there was the resistance. And when I was at primary school, every primary school teacher had been a brave resistor and they'd shown German soldiers who asked for the way to the station the wrong way and were still very proud of these heroic feats. Uh, and so that's really the way um, I grew up. Um, what we didn't really hear very much about uh, when people talked about the resistance, uh, and this is true of the Netherlands probably as, as much as in other countries that have been occupied, was a very different side of resistance. In most countries, people who actively resisted it was pro a fairly small percentage, more or less the same percentage probably of people who actively collaborated. Most people just wanted to survive. And 
uh, what we read about as children was sort of about brave and heroic deeds of daring do and so on, and that was probably relatively rare. But another side of the resistance, which is perhaps much more important, if you look at the resistance, the, the, the clandestine press, for example, in the Netherlands between 1940 and 1945, is how much people were already thinking about the post-war. And uh, clandestine resistance newspapers and so on were full of essays and discussions about what the post-war should look like. A, war, a world that should be more equal, uh, the independence of colonies and so on, all these things uh, were discussed. And indeed, the, the plans for the post-war were really already um, uh, devised during the war on many levels. I mean, one thing that we certainly didn't hear very much about is that there was quite a lot of uh, cooperation between Dutch engineers and city planners, for example, who were not collaborators, but with German uh, city planners and engineers who were very progressive in a way, uh, already started under the Weimar Republic. So even... Uh, blueprints for the Wiederaufbau after the war were already being discussed between Germans and Dutch people, neither of whom were necessarily Nazi sympathizers. But the, what, would, what would happen after the war was very much in people's consciousness. Unlike, say, more recent wars, like the one in Iraq, um, where people gave very little thought, or Afghanistan, to what should happen after you've used the military and you've toppled the regime with consequences that we still live with. One of the most remarkable documents um, of the World War II was one uh, devised by Italian um, anti-fascists. Um, Altiero Spinelli was their leader, who were uh, imprisoned on an island called uh, Ventotene. And in 1941, they already had a manifesto about uh, the integration of Europe. Uh, the Ventotene Manifesto. And their idea was um, nation states were um, uh, no longer, would be out of fashion. Um, they would create nationalism and therefore further wars. The only way forward was to have an, a, a, an integrated, a unified Europe. They were men of the left and they thought that this would be resisted by the British and the Americans, uh, the British because they wanted to hang on to their uh, empire um, but that the continental Europeans should go ahead with this. This is partly a mistake, but not completely. They, hadn't, they, 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 they had a point there. Uh, Robert Schumann, uh, who was arrested by the Gestapo and uh, almost sent to Dachau, was already thinking of a way to have a Franco-German uh, reconciliation after the war, uh, during the war. So this was already very much in his mind, long before uh, the steel and coal uh, community and so on that came after the war. What was not discussed, as, as far as I know, much in the, un, in the underground press, uh, was uh, the nature of the Holocaust, which was, of course, a phrase that didn't exist. Um, but I don't think people paid all that much attention to that, which doesn't mean that they didn't know what was going on. When people say we couldn't have known, um, I always um, would point them out to uh, Anne Frank's diary, uh, she was a 13-year-old girl in an attic in Amsterdam, and it's in the diary that she was listening to the BBC radio, and she knew about the gas chambers. Um, if she knew, then sh certainly uh, most other people could have known too. Also, what is less well known is that Anthony Eden, who was not known as a great friend of the Jews, uh, made a speech in Parliament, I believe in 1942, possibly 1943, um, about uh, mass murder uh, of Jews going on in Poland uh, and other parts of Central Europe. So again, um, people can't say that it was not discussed, it was not known. But knowing is, of course, not the same thing as being able to imagine. And one of the most extraordinary stories, uh, some of you may know it, but is that of a, um, a Polish Jew called Apolinario Hartklas, who uh, escaped from Poland in 1939, uh, went to Palestine and was the sort of liaison person between the Jews in Palestine and uh, uh, the Europeans. And in 1939-1940, he was warning people that what was going to happen was the extermination of the Jews in Poland uh, and elsewhere. Nobody would believe him. Um, then, 
1943, when people started coming out, some people managed to get out of Poland with stories of what was actually happening and were telling Hartglas about what was actually happening, his reaction was, if I believed that, I'd slit my wrists. So even he couldn't really imagine uh, the full extent of what was going on, even though the facts were known. So th that I think that tells us uh, quite a lot about at least that aspect of how the war was remembered after the war, because of course it wasn't really a subject until, uh, in most countries until the 1960s. Now, Spinelli, when he uh, was talking about the Anglo-Saxons and imperialism and standing um, uh, in the way of European integration and so on, was partly wrong. Um, and uh, I would point out that in 1941, again, as a sort of example of a blueprint of what the war was going to look like after uh, the German defeat, in 1941, Churchill and Roosevelt met uh, in Placentia Bay in Canada uh, to draw up the Atlantic Charter. And um, this was a very liberal document. Um, it was about uh, international cooperation, about um, more equality economically, um, and it was about the right for nations to be independent. Now this, of course, was um, a bone of contention between Roosevelt and Churchill. Roosevelt was anti-imperialist. He had no time for British imperialism in particular. Oddly enough, he was slightly soft on Dutch imperialism. He never really criticized the Dutch for hanging on to the Dutch East Indies. This was the one sentimental part of his makeup because of his Dutch background. But he was certainly, he was not in favor of British imperialism. And Churchill was very worried about this idea, putting in the manifesto that nations should have the right to be independent because he certainly did not think that nations like India and Malaya and Burma and so on should have the right to be independent. They were part of the British Empire and in his mind should remain so. Um, and this is perhaps one of the main differences between the war in Asia and the war in Europe in that um, Germany invaded countries that had been independent whereas the, the Japanese war, except in China, but in, in Southeast Asia was seen at the time and is still seen both by people on the left and the right as a war of one imperialist nation against other imperialist nations. And uh, the independence of um, Asian countries um, after 1945, and in some cases this took more time than, than in others, um, this certainly happened because of the war, or at least was speeded up, that the, the Japanese invasion of the Dutch East Indies or um, Malaya uh, or Burma and so on showed that the uh, Western colonial powers um, were relatively weak and, and the nationalist movements in these countries came up as a, as a consequence and um, had no desire to go back to the status quo ante uh, after 1945. The New United Nations Declaration uh, was, which came in, in 1946, but the declaration was drafted in the US in 1941. So already that uh, aspect of internationalism was also already there uh, long before the end of the war. And it was signed in 1942 by Churchill, Litvinov, TV Sung for China, uh, and Roosevelt. So internationalism on the one hand and more equal societies on the other to make sure that um, uh, there wouldn't be future wars, it was very much in people's minds. Um, in Britain, again, especially in Britain, um, left-wing programs of more equality, doing away with class inequality and so on was, was already very much being, uh, being worked on during the war. The Beveridge Report uh, that um, laid the groundwork for the post-war sort of social democracy and the welfare state uh, was um, written in 1942. Um, when they were talking about free school meals and public housing and uh, other things. Attlee, um, Clement Attlee, won the election in 1945 before the war was over with uh, Japan, much to the disgust of people like my British grandmother, uh, who was the daughter of German uh, Jewish immigrants and therefore more patriotic than the Brits. Uh, she thought this was a tremendous betrayal um, of her fellow, fellow countrymen, Churchill, the great Churchill, in her mind, not entirely wrongly, had served her, saved her life 
and how dare people vote against him. But the reason people voted against him was very obvious. It was that um, many soldiers uh, who were mobilized during the war and asked to sacrifice their lives or, or risk their lives were from the working class. Uh, they were, uh, got a political education through the war, partly through education programs organized by the uh, armed forces, and had no desire to go back to the uh, way that society had been uh, before the war. They wanted a real change. And they admired Churchill um, uh, as a great war hero, but um, voted for Attlee because they, they, they didn't want to go back, quite uh, understandably. On internationalism, I'm, I'm sure you all know um, uh, Churchill's famous speech that he made in Zurich uh, in 1945, where he called for the creation of the United States of Europe. Um, initiated, he again said, by a rapprochement between France and Germany. Where he was a little uh, unclear was on what the exact role of Britain would be uh, in a uh, unified uh, Europe. Uh, what he said, and I'll quote, I was very glad to read in the newspapers two days ago that my friend President Truman had expressed his interest and sympathy with this great design. There is no reason why a regional organization of Europe should in any way conflict with the world organization of the United Nations. Great Britain, the British Commonwealth of Nations, mighty America, and I trust Soviet Russia, for then indeed all would be well, must be the friends and sponsors of the new Europe and must champion its right to live and shine. Therefore I say to you, let Europe arise. Well, this is very different language from... Um, Boris Johnson, who um, has the conceit of um, publicly being compared to Winston Churchill. Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, the Nuremberg Tribunal, um, again, um, was not just a judicial exercise. It was very much done as a way to create a new and better world um, post-war. It was a normative. It, I mean, it's been accused um, by people of being victor's justice, which of course it was, and there were many flaws uh, in the Nuremberg Tribunal, perhaps even more in the Tokyo one, um, because the German war had not been exactly the same as the Japanese war, but the both countries were regarded by the Allies in exactly the same way, which caused distortions. But flawed as it may have been, as a normative exercise, um, it was important. Um, to restore the, the idea, this has been said earlier today, that, to restore the idea of the rule of law. But the word that was used over and over in speeches um, by allied prosecutors and judges and so on was civilization. From a savage world, a civilized world had to be built. Um, and Justice Jackson made his famous final speech where he said, civilization asks where the law is so laggard as to be utterly helpless to deal with crimes of this magnitude by criminals of this order of importance. It does not expect that you can make war, that, that, that you can make war impossible. It does expect that your juridical action will put the forces of international law, its precepts, its prohibitions, and most of all its sanctions on the side of peace so that men and women of goodwill in all countries, may have leave to live by no man's leave underneath the law. And then he said, and this is the most important f sentence perhaps, as we judged, so would the future judge us. And those of you who have been lucky enough to see the wonderful documentary by Marcel Orfus about uh, the Nuremberg trial and its consequences um, will know that the West did not do all that well. Um, in the light of this and tended to forget the lessons the Allies themselves wanted to teach uh, the Germans and the Japanese uh, in, uh, in, the, in the year after the war. Now, uh, the Holocaust, as I said, um, although it was mentioned uh, during the Nuremberg trials, um, especially, I think, um, the, the, the Soviet judges were very much involved in it, but did not really become an issue uh, until... Uh, the 1960s. And in a way, and I, I don't want to be misunderstood here, uh, so I have to choose my words very, very carefully. In a way, the fact that the, 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 the scale and the nature of the Holocaust uh, 
made it slightly, it's made life very difficult for the Germans. Uh, I wouldn't have wanted to be a German growing up after the war. But on the other hand, it made it slightly simpler in, in terms of remembrance than it did for the Japanese. Because it was something that everybody could more than, you could easily get a consensus that this was a crime that was so hideous and so huge in scale and so completely un, indefensible that you could uh, get a consensus except for a, a, a small fringe of nutcases that this was something to be completely condemned as indeed subsequently it was in German education and television and films and so on. The Japanese didn't really have a holocaust. They were certainly responsible for the deaths of many people in China and elsewhere, but they didn't have uh, an ideology and a systematic program of extermination of a people who did not have uh, the right to exist. And so for the Japanese, it remained a war of one imperial power against other imperial powers. The war in China is somewhat harder to defend and therefore more complicated. But there is no consensus in Japan about the war um, because there is not one thing that everybody can agree should be completely condemned. And so when people compare Germany favorably to Japan and sort of have cultural explanations of these are Orientals who only have a shame culture and they, they sort of put it all on the rug and these wonderful Christian Germans have searched their conscience and, conscience and so on. Uh, this is actually wrong, I think. I think it's the, 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 the nature of the war in Japan was, was, was different from Germany and therefore it was d more difficult for the Japanese to find a political consensus um, on it. Now, it's simpler to have the Holocaust after all, after all, when people in Germany talk about Vergangenheitsbewältigung and so on, they don't mean the invasion of Norway. They mean the Holocaust. And it's in a way lifted the Holocaust out of history. It's become a kind of almost like a mythology, so like a faith with Anne Frank as, a, as the patron saint. And there is a danger with um, turning history into myth in that um, it becomes harder to... Uh, discuss it in, in, in rational terms um, in a way to find the truth. It becomes easier to instrumentalize uh, politically and so on, and it invites counter-myths. Not only the Holocaust deniers, which is of obviously one political counter-myth, but also um, in the somewhat unedifying an Israeli uh, friend of mine, a philosopher, calls it the Olympic Games of, uh, of Suffering, and the unedifying competition of, well, the Jews of their ho Holocaust, and everybody talks about that. We had our own Holocaust, which is just as bad, and so on. Especially in the United States, this has become somewhat pathological. But I'll leave that aside, because that's uh, stuff for a whole different lecture, and go back to the post-war order uh, as it was uh, designed. Now, the impetus behind internationalism and the welfare state, more equality, more social equality, and so on, was ready to prevent another world war from happening, uh, as was the um, rapprochement between France and Germany, the coal and steel community, the EEC, and so on. But what is sometimes forgotten is one of the great um, um, reasons why people suddenly started believing in, even in world government was the atom bomb. People believed, and Einstein was one, that once the atom bomb had been invented and dropped, this was such a danger to the future of mankind that only the unification, a, a unified world government, would be able to cope uh, with this danger and stave off uh, a, a nuclear holocaust. Now, this didn't happen, of course, um, but, there was, but what did last for a long time was the consensus of uh, social democracy um, in Germany and other countries uh, overlapping Christian democracy, um, namely that there should be more social equality, international cooperation through common institutions, uh, welfare states, and so on, even in the United States. And when I uh, researched uh, my book on 1945, one of the things that struck me most when I found it in the New York Public Library was the magazine uh, for the U.S. Armed Forces, written by GIs for GIs, called Yank. And the politics of Yank in 1945-46 were well to the left of the, of the Democratic Party today. 
So this was, these were the days of the GI Bill, um, of infrastructure programs and so on. Um, uh, the current uh, US administration would uh, almost have regarded them as communists. So this was really uh, a consensus that was pretty much spread all over, certainly the Western world. And it held, I think, um, d during the Cold War. Um, and I was talking at dinner with Richard Bessel about you know, when uh, post-war Europe began and, and, and ended. Uh, there is a, uh, this is a crude argument, but there is an argu argument to be made that post-war Europe more or less overlapped with the Cold War. Because as long as the Cold War um, was there, um, the West needed an alternative to uh, Soviet communism, especially in the 50s when a lot of intellectuals were attracted to communism still. Um, it was necessary to have a Western model of social equality, of economic um, equity and so on that would, um, uh, could compete with the siren song uh, of more radical forms of leftism represented for some people um, by uh, the Soviet empire. And in those days, people forget this. I mean, when they, um, uh, when they condemned the C people who had, had taken money from the CIA for uh, cultural organizations and magazines and so on in the 50s and 60s, they forget that the CIA, certainly compared to today, was a relatively liberal um, institution. Um, yes, it was fighting in communism um, and, uh, and so on, but many CIA people, and I remember uh, still in the, in the 90s when I was spent a year in Washington, that if you wanted to talk to truly sophisticated internationalists who'd been around the world, who spoke languages and so on, you were often best off talking to ex-CIA people because um, uh, they were internationalists uh, of a kind. Now, as we know, this particular um, uh, post-war uh, has been fraying very badly and uh, may even be uh, at an end. If you listen to the rhetoric of Donald Trump um, with his America First uh, stuff, it's really back to the days, the 1930s of, of Limburg um, and uh, a, a nasty um, nativist, anti-immigrant, um, isolationist view um, of America. In other words, and, and it, it includes even um, uh, sometimes not even so carefully veiled uh, anti-Semitic language. For me, the moment that I realized something was seriously broken in the Anglo-American world was during the campaign uh, in, in 2016 when Donald Trump stood on, on, on a platform in Tennessee, I think it was, with Nigel Farage. Uh, and they were talking about the ordinary people who are being betrayed by an international conspiracy of bankers and so on, and the followed names like um, George Soros, etc. Um, many people uh, in the public in Tennessee may not have completely picked up on the signals, but anybody who knows anything about history uh, would have. And so we're really back, um, and, and I don't think this necessarily means uh, we're going to have another Third Reich, but we are back to a period where the language of the 1930s is being more and more openly used again um, without um, um, perhaps enough protest. So I think Donald Trump really represents everything that Roosevelt and Churchill were fighting against in 1941. I mean, Ch Roosevelt was actively fighting the America firsters um, and Churchill, with all his racism and so on, was an internationalist. He was not uh, like the Brexiteers uh, are uh, today. So what has caused this? I don't think it's right to say that it was caused by uh, the, the distrust of the EU, uh, the anti-immigrant rhetoric, the suspicion of minorities and so on. You can't really blame Trump and Nigel Farage. Uh, you can blame them uh, if you like, and I wouldn't mind blaming them. Uh, they are blameworthy and disgusting. But the rot, I think, set in much earlier. And um, I think it sta start first of all, in the case of Europe, it started off by um, British ambivalence from the very beginning about the European project. And this is not just a question of uh, right-wingers and, and conservatives. In the, 19, the late 1940s, when Attlee was still Prime Minister of Britain, um, um, Bevin, the foreign minister, 
um, who had not gone to university uh, or anything like that, was very much against getting involved, Britain getting involved in any European project because he thought, just like uh, the current leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, that um, Britain getting involved in uh, uni uh, European integration would make it impossible to build socialism in Britain. But apart from that, both the left and the right were really um, united in this notion that we stood alone in 1940, which is not quite true, but that's very much the post-war Br British myth. Um, our democracy survived. We were never uh, uh, occupied and, and so on. Why should we get involved in these European schemes? It's fine for them. We are greater than that. And so the ambivalence about Europe and needing Europe to overcome the wounds of occupation, of Nazi government, and so on, were never felt by the British. Aren't really not, aren't felt to this day. Um, in, in America, I think it had a, a, a different um, uh, unfortunate effect, which was that the idea that America had um, successfully defeated fascism and then communism uh, or fought, fought communism as though it was another form of fascism, which in some ways it was, I suppose you can argue, but led to the delusion in America that, that many U.S. presidents suffer from, that uh, they all want to be Winston Churchill all over again. And um, it's, the role, it's the destiny of the United States to fight wars abroad, to spread freedom and democracy in the world in the way that they su so successfully did um, in the 1940s. Um, and we know uh, what consequences uh, that, that has had. I think another uh, reason for the rot to have set in in the post-war order was really the, an, an, an unanticipated, not by everybody, but by most people, an unanticipated result of what happened in 1989 and 1990. And um, we all rejoiced, um, most of us rejoiced uh, about the fall of the Soviet Empire, the fall of the Berlin Wall, I was there with my father on uh, New Year's Eve in Berlin in 1989, drinking Zicht and so on, um, thinking we were going to, uh, a glorious new world had begun and so on. For my father, particularly poignant since he'd been a Zwangsarbeiter in Berlin himself. And so uh, it was a great occasion. Uh, unfortunately, he had one trauma left from the war, which is he couldn't stand bangs and fireworks because it re reminded him of the bombings. And we lost him in the crowd, and he came to our hotel at 3 o'clock in the morning with bandages all over his face because um, a cork from a Zecht bottle had hit him right between the eyes. But that's by the by. Um, what one result of 1989, I think, is that people felt that that reason to have a, a counter model to uh, Soviet communism by having uh, welfare states, social democracy and so on, suddenly became less important. The Soviet Union was no, was no longer there, which made it much easier to, to, to go along with the Thatcher-Reagan idea of um, laissez-faire economics, uh, deregulation, everything that we understand by neoliberalism. Neoliber I think it went even further than that. I think at the time people, either, even any collective enterprise um, for the state to improve people's lives collectively suddenly became suspicious because uh, it's what led to the gulag. It's, it's, it's this Hayekian idea that the more individual freedom, the less the state does and so on, the better it, uh, it is. And any effort to still promote those sort of values, and that includes uh, Europe, it includes the welfare state, it includes um, welcoming immigrants, um, not always for the best reasons, but still welcoming immigrants, um, was uh, perceived as an elite project. And so the right-wing populism that we see now is, um, is not only um, suspicious of Europe, um, suspicious of immigration, uh, and so on, climate change and so on, for rational reasons. The suspicion is also there simply because they are seen as elite projects. This, these are the elites who've pushed this down our throats. If they say climate change is something to worry about, well, screw them. It's, uh, there is no rational reason why climate change and, and, and uh, 
anti-immigrant sentiments have anything to do with each other. There's no logical connection. The only logical connection is that they're both things that are associated with the elites and therefore more and more people are whipped up into an animus uh, against them. So Trump and European populism are really re a reaction to the elite politics that are a holdover, I think, from the post-war order that came from the fear of having circumstances that would make another um, uh, world war uh, possible. Now, what this means is that if we are serious about preserving um, European integration, um, economic e uh, equality and so on, we have to think of a story. It's no longer good enough, as the election of Trump and Brexit have already demonstrated, simply to play on fears of if you elect this clown, there will be a catastrophe. True, but it didn't work as an argument. Or if you vote for Brexit, all the banks will move to Frankfurt or there will be lines of uh, lorries um, all the way from Dover to London and so on. This doesn't really um, uh, impress people very much. The elites are so hated, the establishment and so on, that no, ma m no matter how much you try and scare them, they'll still vote for something that to many of us might seem irrational. So we have to come up um, with uh, another uh, more plausible story. And in my view, I think that means another, fo another form of New Deal. Um, I think that the Democrats in America would be well advised um, to uh, go that, along that route and see how uh, you can um, improve the economy for most people, not just for big companies and Wall Street and so on, um, and, and, and concentrate on that rather than um, uh, go on and on about uh, Trump. My one fear, and um, I'm a pessimist and one of those people who always has a metaphorical suitcase under my bed, my great fear is that great periods of creation and innovation, when people are forced to think seriously about how to improve the world and so on, very often come as the result of a catastrophe. And all I can hope for is that we don't need another one um, for another post-war or another 1945 to occur, especially since very few of us might have survived uh, to see it. And on that very happy note, I'll invite you to ask questions. Sie brauchen nicht äh, Englisch zu verwenden, das kann auch Deutsch. Also gut, dann gehen wir essen. Ja. <lacht> yeah. Thank you for, for your talk. Um, you mentioned that um, when uh, Trump and Nigel Farage gave this uh, presentation in Tennessee, it sounded anti-Semitic. But uh, he has uh, Jewish family members. He's the most pro-Israel president ever. So uh, I, I mean, it doesn't seem like he would intentionally be anti-Semitic. Um, I think he did tweet some social media message with a star of David um, and it uh, was kind of linking Jews and money, but it, I mean, it seems like it was accidental rather than intentional. Right. Um, well, I'm not so sure. First of all, um, um, you, I'm sure most people remember, not remember actively, but know about the famous speech Himmler made in, in uh, I think it was in Posen, when he said, Jeder hat ein anständiger Jude. So it doesn't matter very much. Or, or Kaiser Wilhelm, when, who was told that one of his friends, who was a shipping magnate in Hamburg, was actually Jewish. Was it Kaiser Wilhelm? Was it Karl Lueger? Wer Jude ist, bestimme ich. It was Karl Lueger, nicht? In Wien. Berlin war Kaiser Wilhelm. But ich glaube, dass es, dass, es, uh, dass es Karl Lueger war, der das gesagt hat. Yeah. Wer Jude ist, bestimme ich. Um, 
So it doesn't, it doesn't impress me that um, uh, Trump's uh, most sinister advisor, uh, Stephen Miller, is Jewish. Uh, the son of, uh, not the son, the, gr the grandson of people who escaped from pogroms in Belarus. Um, uh, but, you know, the, even among the Jews, there are some very weird people. Um, and his son-in-law, the less said about him, the better. Being pro-Israel, of course, is not a sign at all of um, uh, philo-Semitism. I would even say the contrary because there's a long tradition that long precedes Trump of um, right-wingers who um, admire Israel for all the wrong reasons, because they're militant, they're nationalist, and they show the Arabs what's what. And um, uh, right now, it's particularly the, um, the far right in Europe, people who a generation ago would have been op openly anti-Semitic, who are now very pro-Israel. And Netanyahu is not shy to, um, to court these people. Uh, and he, he, he likes Viktor Orban. And Viktor Orban likes him. So that's not, a, doesn't, that's not a necessarily proof at all um, that the anti-Semitic um, dog whistles are an accident. I, do, I don't, really don't think they are. On the, on the left, it's a slightly different story. Um, the Labour Party now in Britain um, uh, has these problems that of, of uh, people who are uh, assumed to be anti-Semitic, sometimes rightly. Um, I think that they, because they, the generation of, anti, of, of Corbyn feel that they're inoculated because they've always been anti-racist. And their, anti, their leftism is really anti-racism and third-worldism. In other words, anti-racism and anti-imperialism. And Israel, in their uh, view, um, is the last of the sort of Western colonial oppressive powers. And then there's another streak of anti-Semitism on the left, which also has a long tradition if you um, look at the work of, uh, of Zeev Sternheil in France, for example, which is um, the, the former mayor of London, uh, Ken Livingstone. I, I, I assume um, he is one of those who don't believe all Jews are bad, but do have a strong sense that there is this sinister um, group of very rich Jews who somehow have fingers in all the pies and so on. And um, that's too well known and historic uh, a trope not to be deeply, deeply suspicious of. Yes. It's very difficult for me to understand this uh, antagonism toward the elite. I mean, you don't go to the bus driver if you have a medical problem. So why don't people want the best people to lead them? Could you speak a little more about that? Well, I think the reasons for that are, are, there, are several, there are at least several. Um, one is the nature of, of information and social media, in that um, it used to be that newspapers and television, uh, that the main source of information was relatively limited to uh, newspapers, magazines, and television. They had editors, they had filters, um, and there was more or less, there was some, some were more left, some were more right, but there was more or less a consensus of what you can trust to be the truth. That's all been destroyed. And now people are in their internet bubbles, their own... Uh, uh, websites, they're on, on Facebook and so on, and they have no idea what's true or not anymore. And it's, it's in a sense, it's all propaganda. And so the, the anti-elite feeling is also, uh, it's against the so-called experts um, uh, and so on. So that has something to do with the, the sources of information. I think there is something else, though, and I think the elites are partly to blame themselves. Um, Political part, of course, a, a liberal democracy cannot function without um, us trusting the people we elect to um, act in our interest and have more expertise than we can afford in our daily lives. Um, but that is uh, changed. I can think of at least one reason, which is that the um, representatives that we voted for, the leaders of political parties, traditionally um, represented clear interests. 
political in, uh, uh, class interests, economic interests, and so on. The, the left-wing parties um, represented the interests of the industrial working class and so on. And when politics is about interests, you can have, have great conflicts, but you can also make compromises and the, the elites of the different parties could come to some kind of arrangement which made liberal democracy more or less stable. I think one of the results of the left-wing parties losing their old proletarian constituencies losing their role as, as, as fighting for the economic and social interests of a working class and shifting more and more to issues like anti-racism, uh, ecology, um, and so on, um, tended to be, become morally self-righteous and at the same time were often people who are relatively privileged. And so people who disagreed with them were not only wrong for whatever rational reason you can think of in an argument, but they were immoral. People who had, had, had um, let's say, who were critical of um, allowing families of Gastarbeiter to come, who, who complained about neighborhoods um, being full of foreigners and so on, were very quickly dismissed morally as somehow being morally deficient, racist, amoral, uh, and so on. And I think climate change, has people who, who, who uh, promote climate change, and I happen to think they're right, but have a similar tendency. Those who disagree with climate change, they're immoral. They don't care about the world and, and so on. And that, of course, has created a lot of resentment. And so those who resent that now condemn the, the, the elite and all its projects. And they don't care if they have more expertise, all the more reason to dismiss them. These people think they're better than me because they've been to university and so on. Well, screw them. And uh, it's very difficult to argue with that because it's not a rational argument. But I'm afraid that is the world we're living in. Yeah. yeah uh, just a quick comment on that, and then I want to ask a couple of questions which actually have to do with subject. Um, shortly after the um, Brexit referendum, there was a very interesting, it must have been two or three weeks afterwards, very interesting podium discuss or discussion on Newsnight on BBC Two, where they had two archetypal Remain people and two archetypal Leave people. I don't know if you, you saw this. And the Remain people were sort of two young professionals from North London. But you, know, you, you couldn't get better people uh, from central casting than that. And the two archetypal leave people were two um, housewives in their mid-40s from Hull, which is, is overwhelmingly leave. Um, and the comment which really struck me um, was a comment which I guess some people refer to as sort of stomach talk. It really came from the gut of uh, from one of these, uh, one of the women said, yeah, they said we were stupid. And the other one said, yeah, they said we were stupid. I mean, it, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a really important element of it. It's not so much a matter of interest and so forth. But what I wanted to do was actually try to get us back to uh, the war and violence and what this has to right. do um, with what happened afterwards. Um, and I'd like to make two suggestions. One, you know, that we uh, touched upon when we were talking over dinner. Um, the first is ha having to do with nationalism. And it strikes me that as a result of what I referred to as the, 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 the shock of violence uh, at the end of the Second World War and the defeat of extreme nationalism, that nationalism was fundamentally, extreme nationalism was fundamentally discredited in Europe. Um, so that one can see, uh, I think that one, one, one possibility for trying to understand uh, post-war Europe and trying to, you know, put it together as, as a unit, is to see it as the fall and rise of nationalism. Um, and I think that might be an important way into it, and to some extent, as a result of the, uh, of the violence that one's seen. And in its place, one saw, and this was certainly true within, within the Cold War, of what was essentially an internationalist project in the United uh, of the United States. I mean, it, it's the sort of thing that Vicky de Grazia wrote about in uh, the, ir the, the Irresistible Empire on the one hand, and the internationalism of the socialist commonwealth 
on, on the other. Um, but I think that you know, seeing this as the fall and rise of nationalism coming out of the bankruptcy of extreme nationalism and violence in the Second World War might get us somewhere. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, well, it, it's, that's a, it's such a complicated issue, I think, because um, especially people on the left had a tendency to blame um, the horrors of World War II on nationalism. Uh, Churchill had a slightly different and more old-fashioned uh, var variation of that. When he, um, uh, his, his uh, analysis of, of Hitlerism was that it was a form of Prussianism, that it was simply uh, a kind of newer form of, of German na Prussian na uh, militarism and so on. Both uh, are wrong, I mean, especially Churchill's uh, analysis, I think, is wrong. But one can go too far in simply blaming it on nationalism too, because national socialism and fascism um, are not simply manifestations of ultranationalism. I mean, there is an internationalist component to them. Um, but let us, for the sake of argument, accept that, uh, that extreme nationalism was, it was one of the main reasons that th th these things happened. But Ian, I wasn't talking about whether they were right or wrong. Right. I was talking about how one tries to interpret them. Well, I think it had one, un it had one fortunate consequence, is that immediately after the war, um, it did lead to um, European countries coming together, and uh, especially France and Germany, uh, and so on, which is an entirely positive thing. Um, the internationalism to which this has led benefited, of course, people like us, the elite, people who travel from university to university, who go to international conferences, who are bankers, and, and indeed uh, football players. I mean, the football players are the best Europeans around. I mean, I was listening to, uh, to a, a Dutch player the other day, Schneider, who played, who played for Bayern, I think, at one point. And he spoke fluent Italian, and he speaks, speaks fluent uh, Spanish, and he speaks fluent German, and so on. And so uh, the elite has benefited from internationalism. People who are less privileged, perhaps less. And I think... Again, there is something wonderful about the skepticism about nationalism. And I remember in 1991 when I was in Berlin and um, Holland played Germany uh, in the European uh, um, Cup and um, beat Germany, I remember, to my great pleasure, uh, two to nil. And the German commentator on television watching scenes of all these ridiculous people in orange jumping up and down and dancing and singing. And the German commentator says, Ach, es ist vielleicht auch besser so. Which I, <laughs> which I was very impressed by. <laughs> and I don't think they would say that anymore. Um, I think it's a good thing that young Germans can openly express pleasure in, in uh, their country doing well, including on the football field. Um, but, and I think it's gone a little too far. I think part of the resentment of a lot of people against the elites is that the elites almost outlawed expressions of, of, of patriotism, except on the football field. I mean, that was the, the one little uh, sort of um, uh, place where people could sort of um, express these things. But apart from the football stadium, it was really taboo. And people who do not go to international conferences and universities and banks and Erasmus programs and so on need something to feel part of that they can be proud of that's bigger than themselves and so on. I think there's been the tendency, perhaps, amongst liberals to um, not read that uh, generously enough and to dismiss it as uh, at best old-fashioned, at worst racist. And it's one of the things that's led to the animus against elites. Ian, you talked about the lessons of war. Is it the lessons of war, or is it the opportunity provided by war to, the, to learn the lessons of the slump? Islam? The slump. Oh, I, I was thinking, how am I possibly going to answer this question? <laughs> um, uh, the slump. Well, I think in Germany that, that, that's still a trauma, but I'm not, you mean the slump of 1929? Yes, because I, mean, I was thinking about, you know, what, why, is, why is the welfare state uh, a lesson of war? Why is sort of economic uh, union 
Yeah, well, I think... Actually, what people are actually yes. doing, what they're actually doing is they're, they're learning the lesson of the, of the 30s, but yes. now they have an opportunity to, to, to implement that. No, I get it. I, I agree with you. I think, uh, well, the, the two are linked, of course. I mean, if, if, if you take the view, which certainly in the case of Germany uh, was true, that um, not only Versailles, but, but the slump, um, had it played a very big role in uh, the success of, of the Nazi movement, um, then it, it clearly must have been in people's minds that we have to make sure that those kind of circumstances don't occur again, just as it was in people's minds that uh, they shouldn't repeat the mistakes of Versailles. Uh, so in that sense, absolutely, but I don't think that they would have perhaps drawn that conclusion quite so... Well, they, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely they would have, because... Uh, as I s because already during the war, um, these ideas were being developed, and that, that, that clearly had something to do with the slump. Yeah. yeah you, you stressed uh, very strongly internationalism, and I think uh, that's perfectly right. But I would argue it's more right so if you look to the United States as compared, for example, to a Great Britain, uh, where basically most uh, British politicians were very reluctant internationalists. But we could also make, <coughs> especially with respect to Great Britain, and you alluded to that uh, when, when you referred to the Atlantic Charter and the controversy with Roosevelt and, and Churchill on the colonies, I mean, you could also make a different argument. I mean, the lessons of the war in Great Britain, after all, was a defense of the empire. And somewhat the similar argument you can also make for France. And basically, from being reluctant internationalist, uh, France became an internationalist in the 50s, with the empire definitely crumbling. And the same, in a way, the same is true uh, for Great Britain. But I mean, coming back to today, I mean, the lessons of the war might be basically the wrong lessons one took from the war the fight for the empire and if you I mean right currently I live in, in Great Britain uh, or for a year I have lived now in, in Great Britain I mean if you look at the debates it's this empire that is the, the imaginative empire that is uh, there um, that is quite uh, mind boggling for somebody who comes from continental, uh, continental Europe I mean this idea that basically, I mean, India and the Asian countries, uh, they all will align uh, with Great Britain. So in terms of the lessons of the war, I mean, it might be from the beginning, there might have been some other lessons in terms of lessons of the empire, which are there as phantom pains after having lost the empire then. Yes, but, 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 you mustn't, but one mustn't forget that uh, for Churchill, the two are not mutually, mutually exclusive he would have seen his defense of the empire as a form of internationalism and that it was Britain's responsibility to um, make sure that, that the world was stable and peaceful and orderly and so on and so forth. Also, uh, and it's, it's, it's also perhaps indicative of the fact that many people in Britain did not think of the empire in the first place in 1940 when they... Th when they um, were mobilizing against Germany to defend Britain. Um, that, uh, certainly, Attlee didn't think that. Um, and in Churchill's famous speeches to raise the morale in 1940, um, he never he, he mentioned empire, but only in passing. It was never he didn't he never made it explicit that this was a war that we fight to preserve the empire. It was to preserve the, the island race, uh, our freedom, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think probably. Um, even my grandmother uh, would not, for her, the, the, the preservation of the empire would not have played a very large role. She was certainly a romantic, but she would have believed in, in freedom, democracy, uh, va British values, and so on. So, and I also think that that attitude lasted, and the, the borderline between believing in the empire and, and, and believing in internationalism was, could be fuzzy. I'm writing a book about the rise and fall of the Anglo-American order, beginning with the Atlantic Charter and Roosevelt and, and, and Churchill, ending with Trump and Brexit. 
One thing, there are two things that, go, that when you research this, the, the story, go through it like a, a, a refrain. One is Churchill, especially in America, this idea that, you know, you need Churchill's bust in the Oval Office, and, you know, Kennedy loved Churchill, Bush loved Churchill, they all loved Churchill. Uh, the other thing is Munich. Every time there's been, a, since World War II, there's been an international crisis that, where they had to debate whether to intervene. Munich, 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 Munich. It's what Eden said in, uh, with Suez. It's what um, uh, Eisenhower said with Lebanon. It's what Johnson said in Vietnam. Uh, it's, uh, uh, up to this day, we, we cannot appease. We know what happened in the 30s. If we appease again, it'll be worse. And it may be wrong-headed. It's not necessarily a sign of that they're not internationalist. Yes. Thank you very much for uh, the great uh, lecture. And um, I just had a quick question um, um, regarding the framing of the ending and the opposition between um, the elites and uh, the general people that have been forgotten. Um, Jean uh, Werner Müller in uh, Princeton argued that uh, if we choose these uh, lands, we risk to replicate the language of the populists and sort of the concepts of the populists themselves. And if we look carefully, neither Trump nor Farage are come from the common people, right? Come from the common folk. Sure. Um, and I wonder if uh, an issue there might be, for example, in the case of uh, uh, climate change that you mentioned, and the fact that uh, the, the opposition to that must come from that, from that contraposition between elite and people because that's the only reason why you would oppose climate change. But I wonder if instead that's because the promise um, of uh, consumerism is incompatible with uh, the belief in climate change and the belief that if everyone is equal, then everyone should be allowed to consume equally, right? That's where I see the connection between the anti-immigrant and uh, racist sort of uh, strand of current times and the, the climate crisis, which is really the crisis that's happening. So I'm not sure if it's something that comes just down from the elites um, and if that's the um, sort of the, the, the frame that is useful to actually understand that as a matter of fact, you either believe in climate change and therefore the West should consume less or you should allow people from Latin America, China to consume as much as the West or you, ju you just don't believe in climate change and believe that Americans should consume more uh, and should have a higher quality of life than um, people in uh, the third world. That's where I would see the connection. Yes. Um, well, there are various questions there. One, uh, Trump is not typical. Um, that's no doubt true. But people who lead um, ethnic and populist nationalistic movements very rarely are typical. Um, after all, uh, Goebbels was not the um, perfect example of a, a blonde, blue-eyed, athletic Aryan male. Um, nor was Hitler perhaps an absolute, you know, this Gefeiter from Braunau, a, a, a typical German. But so th that doesn't really prove anything. I think what Trump has very cleverly done, and it's not just um, calculation because I think it's very much part of his personal makeup. He shares with a lot of Americans resentment against elites. He comes from a louche um, uh, uh, background of, of um, um, developers and, um, and so on. And develop it, by the way, it's, it's interesting that in many of these populist movements, also in Europe, um, people who are housing developers and so on play a big role. They, they tend to be b businessmen who've made a lot of money and always with a slightly shady uh, side to it, which means that other people with older money look down on them. And Trump comes from a family that is very shady. Uh, they were involved in the mafia. The, 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 he was never, he's vulgar and so on, um, his, he was never really accepted as one of their own by the old New York uh, 
elite, even the real estate elite. So he has a real chip on his shoulder. And he manages to transfer that to people who um, are obviously much less well off than he, he was. And I think that's true of the successful fascist leaders. That they, in, on, on a certain in a certain manner, we're on the same wavelength as, as even Hitler, who was not typical of anything much, but, was, but knew how to talk to people who would naturally support him because he understood their resentments and hatreds for people who were better educated uh, and, and, and so on, experts and all that. So there's a natural f affinity even between people who, on the one hand, might be immensely rich and people who have very little. Um, on the consumerism, you're of, co you're, you're of course right. Those are the uh, crucial issues. But somebody who believes Trump, when he, who, who loses his job in the coal industry, say, where in, in vast numbers of, of jobs are being lost, um, but even people who are not losing their jobs, but somehow feel that the old world is the, the way that they, the, the world they knew the world where perhaps ethnically they felt that they were in charge and blacks and others would always remain inferior until Obama got elected. And that was a double whammy because not only did he have a colored skin, but he was also uh, a highly educated man from Colombia and so on and so, and, and, and so seen as a double affront. Uh, uh, people who feel that the world is slipping out of their fingers, they... Uh, resent the elites and everything the elites stand for. And that's not as rational as consumerism and, and the relative position of developing countries and develop, the developed world and so on. We're, we're, I think the, if, if you want to look at why the rhetoric of uh, demagogues is, is effective, you won't find it by, by finding a rational economic or political uh, analysis of it. Oh, that will get you so far, but it won't explain the whole thing. Hey, um, you'd mentioned that uh, extreme nationalism is not a sufficient way to understand this moment. Could you say a little bit more about how we could talk about this moment in other terms in such a way that we can recoup nationalism perhaps in a way, or the elites can recoup it, so we can talk about people's need, a sense, need for a sense of belonging outside their immediate neighborhoods? Thank you. Yeah. Well, Americans don't need to be reminded um, of America because it's often the only thing they know. Um, but um, uh, extreme nationalism, um, how, I'm not entirely sure how to answer the question. Um, where would you want me to add more on that subject? If, I think uh, one of the reasons why the, the elites, at least the academic elites, discredit uh, nationalism is because they kind of, that's the first association. So is there a way we can reframe that moment? Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Thank well, you. first of all, I think w something that, that, that masquerades as nationalism isn't necessarily just, nas uh, uh, just um, nationalism. The, the greatest animus, um, let's, for example, among a lot of Brexiteers, is not against foreigners. I mean, that's there too, and they'll get blamed for everything and so on. But it's against um, uh, uh, British traitors. So on the one hand, you have the believers, and, uh, and everybody who disagrees with you is a traitor. And um, the, one of the differences between fascism and national socialism is that uh, national so socialism was not so much about the nation. It was that too. But it was perhaps even more about race which was a domestic issue as well as an international one. So I think blaming everything simply on nationalism um, uh, leads you astray. Now, how to give people that sense of belonging uh, and so on, I don't pretend to have a clear answer to it, and if I tried to answer it, I'd be glib. I mean, one of the reasons it's become such an issue in... Uh, in some countries, I think you can't really give a general answer to it because I think it depends very much on the historical circumstances of the country. Uh, take my own native country. Thirty years ago, anybody who'd said that the far nationalist right would do very well in Holland would be declared in, insane. 
because they were very, the, the nationalism of the Dutch in the 60s, 70s, 80s was precisely that they were in the avant-garde of everything that was liberal and international and anti-nationalist and policemen who smoked dope and so on and so forth. And um, the, one of the reasons that even there now you have this strong nationalist backlash, right-wing backlash, I think is that um, the, the, the kinds of um, belonging people had disappeared partly as the result of our rebellions in the 60s that at the time with, uh, if you were young and lived in a city and so on were co considered to be entirely salutary. For example, before the 60s, the main identification for many people was not really national. It was whether you were Catholic, whether you were Calvinist, whether you were uh, this or that. And if you were Catholic, you voted Catholic, you sent your children to Catholic schools, you played in Catholic football clubs, uh, went to Catholic pension funds, and, and so on. With, when, with, the, with the erosion um, of organized religion, all that really um, started to float. And that left an awful lot of people without really knowing anymore what their identification was. I mean, the elite, again, people like me, uh, had no trouble with it because we're perfectly happy with a Europe of open borders and speaking different languages and so on. But I think it's, it's precisely those people who are adrift who suddenly started looking for you know, ways of being Dutch in a way that before hadn't really mattered so much to them. They took it for granted. And something like that may be happening uh, elsewhere. I mean, if, you, if you're a former citizen of, of the DDR and you're not doing very well, probably when you grew up in the DDR, Germany was not your main uh, um, source of identification. Now, for those people, it is. Faute de mieux, maybe. Oh, sorry, you, you yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, I have the mic, even though, actually, the conversation has now become so far-ranging that what I was thinking about is sort of five people back. Well, no, no, um, no, no. I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure what we're talking about anymore. But, um, but, but, but one thing uh, that, that was striking me was, there was, was, yeah, was the discussion of, of elites. And, I mean, it seems to me there as well that, you know, so the way that we understand you know, this sort of polar, this ostensible polarization between, you know, some sort of you know ostensible lost uh, kind of you know working class identity, which yes, very frequently turns out to be a version of a particular, a very particular white male working class identity, and as has been pointed out, you know, other people are working class as well, is that we, is that I think, that, you know, we, we lose track, and it's easy to do, we lose track of the ways in which the discourse is shifting all the time, right? So that now, I think there, whether or not you want to talk about the Green New Deal or, uh, but, but that there, I think there is an increasing recognition that, for example, climate change uh, is an issue that most urgently affects not the elite. I mean, yes, there may be people in Brooklyn buying vegan baby food, but that's not really the point because they're not going to vote for Trump anyway. Um, and so that, uh, that, that it's actually poor communities, communities of color, it's, uh, it's, it's minority communities, it's, it's um, uh, working class communities that are suffering the most from these impacts and that that is something that is not, you know, it, it, that that's something people actually are starting to be able to understand. So that I, I think that if we sort of focus too much on this notion of, you know, the resentment of the elites on issues like climate change or even, you know, visions of universal health care or whatever. I mean, I, I think we may be missing some very real political developments that we need to be alert to if, as you, you know, if in fact we're not going to do what you were worrying about at the end of your talk, which is to yes. kind of repeat uh, no, no, mistakes. I, I entirely take your point, but the, the, the people of color and the minorities and so on who would suffer disproportionately are not the ones who are voting for, the, for, for Trump. 
But the, where, where it becomes much more irrational is the, the less privileged white voters who suffer just as much and still vote for Trump. Now, that you can only explain by uh, th saying that what they resent is stronger than what their interests uh, might be. And um, on the elites, I think, to, to come back to more perhaps to the, uh, since you're quite right to point that out, to the um, topic of the conference, um, all through human history, the politics of elites are how an elite can claim the legitimacy to rule. And after 1945, various shifts took place. One was the um, voting out of Churchill to get rid of the stranglehold of the old upper class. So you got a more grammar school educated, um, more um, middle and lower middle, even working class elite that could come up. That was one thing that happened. The other hand, on the European level, Schumann and Monet and so on, if you read their memoirs, they were incredibly top-down. This really was an elite project. It was a project of Adenauer and, 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 uh, and, and de Gaulle and so on and so forth. There was, there was nothing bottom-up uh, about that. I think, again, 1989, 1990 was, was a real shift. Shift, uh, although something that had been going on for longer already. But if you look at Blair and Clinton, their um, idea of the new elite, which was not that new, but, but it was marketed as such, was a, merit, a new meritocracy, was, uh, which is why they don't care or they don't see why there's something slightly off about giving lectures and being paid $200,000 for it. Their idea was, it's our turn now. Anybody who's smart and um, ambitious enough to uh, make it, like us, um, you know, we have the right to get rich just as much as you know, these, the old upper class used to. And it's something that, that would have been alien to something like Attlee or his generation. And in, in some ways, that is that, the, 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 the new elite that the populists today are reacting against not so much upper class, because they barely play a role anymore, although Britain, a little, you have these old Etonians, but in America, the old upper class Repub country club Republicans and so on, they're gone. So what, and they're not reacting to people who have huge amounts of money because they don't resent Trump for that. It's people who have a better education, been to better universities, um, look down on them. It's this new, an idea of, a merit, of, of people who feel that they have merited to be the elite uh, on the grounds of, uh, of mostly of superior education. And so um, when people go on about the experts and how they hate the experts and so on, in a way it's, it's, it's saying that um, we don't trust the legitimacy of that particular elite to rule us anymore. Now what the elite will be to replace it is, is another thing. And there I think there's a real difference between Europe and America in that I see in Europe a, a tendency, again, in Holland is a fairly good example, but it's going on in Austria as well and, and probably in IFD circles too, is that there, you won't find many people amongst the Trumpists who are proud of not only being young, but wearing beautiful tailor-made suits and monogrammed shirts and shoes from sort of, you know, the most expensive shoemakers in London and so on, which you find now amongst the sort of new, uh, it, it's the kind of um, um, uh, a, a, a Burschenschaft right wing. And it's, it, it reminds me a little bit of the sort of dandies in the Action Francaise in the 20s, this sort of quasi-aristocratic yearning that you find with new young right-wingers. When I grew up, and you grew up, people on the far right were sort of scuzzy middle-aged men in dirty raincoats who probably were in porno cinemas and so on. Now you get these smart young sort of presentable young men driving Porsches and things. And you don't find that with the Trumps because America doesn't have that quasi-aristocratic tradition. I mean, the, what's his name? Bannon is, a little, uh, is ideologically a little like that, but he is far from wearing monogrammed shirts. This is perhaps not entirely an answer to your question, but I'm riffing. <laughs>
But as Tina said, I think it's um, it's very much about this post-war world order that from the 1950s on, there was the Deutsche Wirtschaftswunde, and the same happened in America. And um, every generation knew that they will be better off than their parents were, mm -hmm. and especially in America today, but it's starting, of course, um, also in many other places in the West or in Western countries. Um, young people know exactly that they won't be better off than their parents, on the contrary. Uh, and that there is um, uh, this struggle of resources uh, in people's minds, um, which is, of course, closely related to climate change. Now, with, I don't know, right now, various uh, Indian mega cities facing uh, basically, uh, the fact that there's no water around now. <laughs> they don't know what they're going to drink tomorrow. Um, and so th these, are, these are quite drastic changes from the po post-war world order. But there's another thing that I was thinking of when, when you were raising the question is how long, sort of when did the post-war end? Did it end in 1989? I, I grew up in the 1970s and 1980s, and in many ways it still felt a little bit like post-war Europe, uh, which was, of course, also connected to the Cold War. Um, but then this threat disappeared, and as a, as a matter of fact, it's a very strange phenomenon right now that I think that this threat is as real as it hasn't been for a very, very long time. Basically, the nuclear threat with um, a lunatic like Trump sitting next to this infamous button, uh, but with what was going on, what is going on with Iran and Korea. Um, but obviously we're all too busy with other things, uh, with threats of climate change and populism and nationalism and so on, that nobody even pays attention. Um, but maybe also because this kind of feels related to the post-war world order and, and there's no talk about a world government uh, that reacts to the threat of uh, a growing uh, um, sort of nuclear armed race, which is actually happening. Yes, no, uh, everything you say is true, but the, the paying of attention is, of course, very human because we couldn't live our lives if we constantly paid full attention to all these po potential disasters. And one of the interesting photographs in your uh, exhibition upstairs is um, I think there's a, a juxtaposition. There's a photograph of um, people in Dachau on the one side of the panel, and then there are people sitting in cafes and, and uh, around the Odeon Platz on the other. And if you w look at the pictures of the people sitting in cafes on the Odeon Platz, you wouldn't know that there was anything going on. Their lives were completely normal. And it was presumably taken in the early, th in the 30s, when things were anything but normal. But you don't really, most people won't notice it until they're forced to. And the problem with climate change is that for most people, certainly in the West, they're not yet sufficiently forced to. They're, it's, it's something, that's why politicians still tend to shy away from it, because it's not something that you can promise for the next election, it's far away, well, maybe my children, uh, and it, anyway, it's in India, and, and, and so on and so forth. And people really only will, will deal with these things when their noses are rarely rubbed into it, which, of course, happened uh, in, in, during the war. And so, you know, to come back to the question of the slump of 1929, sure, people were thinking about it, and absolutely was a reason to change the way things were done. But probably without the drama of the war, they wouldn't have actually done it. We haven't had anybody from this side of the room. Maybe I can ask you another another question yeah. on this on this point. You've you've mentioned the uh, the connection between anti-immigration and climate change, and you said, and that's what we you were discussing about, is that there is no link between those two topics. And I would argue, of course, there's a link, and it's just called climate migration. And I'm, con I'm convinced that this link, this connection between uh, climate change and uh, immigration is, is becoming more and more important in, in the future. And it, uh, the, the immigration movements we, 
we already have, they are caused by, by climate change, of course. They well, are caused by climate change. to a certain extent. I mean, the people that, course, that Angela Merkel um, said the Schaffen does, none of them are coming because of climate change. And so, well, Syria is not because of climate change. It's because of a terrible war. Yeah, but Syria had years of droughts that were ignored. Well, yeah, and but, but most of the, sure, but most of the refugees were not coming for that reason. But I totally agree that in the future this is going to be a bigger and bigger issue. But I doubt that most people who vote for the far right because they don't want Ausländer, whether they consciously make that link. I mean, I, I think politicians sh are thinking about it, and if they're not, they should be thinking about it, because it, th that link is clearly true. But I think it, it doesn't yet exp uh, explain the politics of today so much. Bon. That's it. That's the end of the entertainment. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> and you were all invited to stay for a glass of wine, um, something more. Thank you. It's not yeah.